Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, this is Scott Bichetti from Geopath, and I just wanted to welcome everybody to today's session and just say thank you for, for joining the session today. Um, today is the third in our series that we've been conducting. It's our uh, measurement and methodology series that we've been conducting. And um, what we want to focus on today is how Geopath's impressions have evolved. Um, and you know, just if you've been following along with this with this series, the whole goal of the measurement and methodology series that we've been doing is just to take a st few steps back. Um, we started uh, two months ago talking about refreshing on you know media measurement, media math, that th those kinds of topics. So we talked about reach frequency, TRPs, etc. Um, last month we talked about you know our our roadside methodology. We want to make sure all of our members are well-versed in, in how to talk about these things, um, specifically as we're starting to move into this part of the series, our methodology. Um, and one of the key things, you know, uh, that we want to talk about today is, you know, how, oh, how impressions have evolved over time. Um, and so with me to, to do that are Brian Schopper and AJ Chaffee, who've been along with me on, on this series uh, from, you know, from the beginning. So uh, they'll be joining in and, and talking about various aspects of, of the topics. And the key things that we're going to talk about are um, kind of the, these factors that really play a role in impacting impressions, particularly in roadside. Um, so things like vehicular and pedestrian traffic, how do we understand a person's per vehicle and home location now that we have access to all this mobile data? Um, and how, you know, how does speed and dwell time um, get impacted and visit, as well as the visibility adjustment. So there's a lot of different factors over time that, again, because we have access to more granular data, that has allowed us to evolve what we do and how we do it. And again, we thought it was really good to just go back and revisit some of these topics. Um, as we go through today, you know, please feel free to ask questions right along. Also, you know, um, the chat feature is open. Um, we, can, we can also look in the chat as well. Um, ideally, it'd be great if everybody can put their questions in the, the Q&A widget versus the chat. Sometimes it's, it gets a little hard to, to monitor both at times uh, as, we're, as we're moderating the session. So, um, and again, we'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. Um, and if we can't, we'll follow up after the session um, as well. Okay, so, Taking another step back, um, this was some information we talked about in the last webinar. So how do we go from, you know, how do, how do we know whatever, 30% of the people that pass by this unit say they've been to a Starbucks in the past 30 days. And this is kind of a high level um, explanation of our methodology. This, this in particular is available as a one pager in our Geek Out library. And again, we, we did a deep dive into each of these columns in the last in the last webinar, and I'll, at the end of this, I'll, I'll show you where you can uh, go and, and re rewatch that or, or watch it for the first time um, if you if you haven't seen it. But basically, at a high level, um, we need to understand uh, household level population data, and we're leveraging data from from Claritas, um, and they're leveraging Scarborough data, they're leveraging uh, credit card purchase data, um, just a, a, a GFK MRI data, so a whole series of data. And we're able to understand at a household level, um, but we ultimately ladder it up to a census block loop level of uh, these neighborhoods, right? We're understanding the behaviors, the demographics, the consumers, the attitudes, the, the psychographics of these neighborhoods. And similarly, at the, simultaneously, we're also understanding people's movement all across the country. So we're leveraging that mobile data to, um, to create a, essentially like a, an activity map across the US of how everybody's moving, the trips they're taking, why they're taking these trips, how they're taking these trips. And so those two things get melded together. Um, and we understand the which trips, take them in front of which pieces of inventory, and we're able to contextualize that in terms of, of our other things, you know, adding opportunity to see as well as dwell time, moving into likelihood to see, and then adding the, the specific metrics to that, such as, you know, reach, frequency, et cetera. So it's a very high level explanation of this. Um, like I said, there's a webinar we did last time on it and we're always happy to talk to, talk to anyone more about this if they wanna reach out to us at Geek Out. Um, another thing that I wanna 
talk about, and again, we talked, we touched on it briefly in the last session is some of our data sources and how they all kind of what, what data sources give us which information and how that all gets kind of um, kind of melded together to use that term again into kind of what we do. And there's a couple of key parts. So if you look in the upper left hand corner, this audited inventory that that is the basis of what we do. We need to understand and we need to audit all the inventory in our system. And you know that's what the, the team here at Geopath is doing. When new inventory comes in, we ensure you know, uh, the, the location, the angle to the road by degree, um, the size, um, you know, the geocode to the sixth decimal. So we're really taking a lot of time and it's a, it's a huge part of what we do. And then we're overlaying all these other data sources that help get us to the, the different um, metrics. So understanding uh, traffic counts, we're leveraging DOT, but we're also, you know, we're still leveraging DOT, but we also overlay the, our city labs data, which is now owned by Bentley. I mentioned the demographics, the Claritas data. Um, we're also using uh, mobile geolocation data as well as kind of leveraging other data sources to understand people's movement, their, their trip info and their home locations. Uh, and again, it's always important to note, and I want to always say this is we're not looking at any personal identifiable information. It's always aggregated, anonymized information we're getting. And we're also laddering that up to the census block group level to do what we do. Um, so both, so what we're going to do in the coming sessions, and again, I'll talk about this at the end, we're going to have a session on how we audit our inventory. And then I believe the next session we have scheduled is talking about our data sources. So we'll dig deeper into this slide uh, in, the coming, in the coming months as well. With that said, um, today we want to get back to and talk about what are those key components, just as you're thinking about inventory or wanting to understand kind of what we do, that, that impact out of home impressions. Um, and like I said, I've kind of listed a bunch off early early on in the session. We're, we're going to dig deep into each of these. And to do that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, first Brian Chopper, and then AJ will come in and, and talk more about it as well. Thanks, Scott. Um, so yeah, so as Scott just mentioned, you can see here this, this list of topics that we're going to cover today. And this is by no means all of the things that impact out of home impressions. Um, but these are just some of the main ones that we wanted to identify uh, just for everyone's purposes so they could be able to talk about them themselves. Um, but also, you know, we, we find it'll be helpful to go back and look at how the legacy data was created in a little way and talk about what we're doing today and sort of how the, how the data inputs have improved, how the methodology has improved in different ways like that, and just kind of how we've evolved our impressions uh, with the new data sources and into the insights data. So uh, first, we want to start and talk about the vehicle, sorry, vehicular traffic counts and why they matter. Um, so at the most basic building block of circulation, we have traffic counts. And in order to understand circulation of cars and people and all that throughout any, any market anywhere, we need to first understand the actual traffic counts. Um, and it's important to know that a lot of times higher traffic counts do lead to higher impressions, but they're not necessarily a correlation directly that way. You know, higher traffic counts don't always lead to higher impressions, um, but in a lot of cases it does trend that way. But there's always factors such as, you know, illumination, vehicular, occup vehicular occupancy, and just other things that we are going to talk about today as well. Um, but we are, if you actually go to the next slide as well, Scott, I want to use this. So one of the, one of the major things, and this is a theme throughout basically all of the topics that we're going to talk about today, uh, is that the data that we have today is a lot more granular and a lot more detailed than what we used to have in our legacy tools. Um, and again, you might hear me say this a couple times as we go through, but it, it's true for, for a lot of these different factors. And so sort of speaking to that, as Scott mentioned earlier, you know, we, do, we did in the past rely heavily on DOT traffic counts to understand just how, you know, vehicular movement and circulation and all of that. Um, but there is a lot of default numbers and somewhat, uh, you know, aggregate, uh, aggregated numbers that you would need to, to do with that. And that was just kind of the best data that we had at the time. Um, and like Scott mentioned, we still do use DOT, uh, DOT information, but what is really the core of our traffic data now and our traffic counts now is the, uh, the product from City Labs. It's now owned by Bentley, but Basically, Bentley's product and their, their data product just allows us to have 
a lot more understanding in both, you know, in both in both directions on a roadway, but also for every road segment, we're able to understand traffic counts at at a specific hour at a specific roadway in both directions. Um, and the way that that differs a lot is that, again, not only are we just relying on the DOT traffic counts, um, but within those DOT uh, those DOT counts, there were a lot of assumptions and sort of averages used because that was what was available. So for example, like county roads, if there weren't, or, or roads that didn't have DOT counts, the county average would be used for the circulation. Um, or you can see on the left side at the bottom for a roadway that had two different directions, basically the volume would just be cut in half. Um, and, you know, that works for, for a certain purpose, but at this point we have much more granular data to understand actually the directional road segments and all of that together. So just in a general sense, a lot fewer uh, assumptions and averages used and a lot more granular data. And, and I also think just to jump in too, just the ability to have a, um, a complete network versus the DOT counts, which might have been, you know, um, for particular segments or might have been taken at different times, we have more of a holistic kind of uh, sense of, 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 of traffic counts across the US, which I think is really important and key and a, and a, a massive improvement for us. Mm -hmm. Yes. And also, um, another point I wanted to mention, in, in the defaults and the averages that I was talking about that we used to have, um, that would also include things like you know, speed on, on highways. And we now have better understanding, and we'll talk about that later as well, but we just have better understanding of how people move throughout an entire network, as Scott was saying, both, you know, the amounts of traffic moving and then the counts of all that, but just kind of better detail about how people move and how fast and, you know, roadways and all of that. So there's a lot more granularity now. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is persons per vehicle. So, uh, you know, it, it can of course happen where there's a singular person in one vehicle, you know, just one person per vehicle. That does happen, but that's not usually the case in, in most markets. And in, in fact, the average is, uh, we can, on the next slide, we'll talk about what we used to use uh, for the average, but in, in general, it's usually not just one person per vehicle or the vehicular occupancy, you might see it uh, written out as. Um, but certain aspects of the market itself can really affect the person per vehicle uh, numbers that we're seeing. So like the the qualities of the market itself, the density, the different, you know, if it's a, an urban area or a suburban area or a rural area or something. So all of that can really play into the different kinds of vehicular occupancy that we're seeing. Um, but even things like markets that have low vehicular ownership, like using New York as an example, not a ton of people own cars, but if you look in a car driving, uh, chances are there's usually more than one person in it. Um, because of things like ride shares and, and all sorts of things like that. So changes or, or differences in densities of the markets themselves and also just the purpose of the trip can even make a big difference as well. So for things like commuting purposes, that might result in a lower persons per vehicle. Um, but for things like shopping or for leisure trips, that could definitely result in higher numbers of persons per vehicle just by the, the nature of the trips themselves. Um, and if we go yeah, to the next slide as well, you can see here on the left. So if we were looking at five plus uh, impressions, it was about a 1.6 uh, average for persons per vehicle. But otherwise, if you're looking at just like total person zero plus, uh, the national average was used as five or 1.5 persons per car. And so that was kind of, again, the best data that we had at the time. But now because of the more rich and more granular data sources that we do have at our disposal, because of things like mobile data and just understanding how people move through markets, we have a much more rich understanding of the actual number of people per vehicle sort of average by road segment in a particular area. So we just have a lot more dense, a lot more rich information on the persons per vehicle as well. Um, so pedestrian traffic is also super important and something that has made a pretty decent change from our legacy data to today. Um, depending on the type of the area itself or the area itself, pedestrians can actually make up a majority of the audience in that area. So for areas, of course, like tourist areas or 
business commercial districts, really anything like downtown tourist areas, there's tons of places where a majority of the audience is just pedestrians. Um, so if you think of a place like, uh, like Michigan, Avenue, Michigan Avenue in Chicago or something, there are obviously cars that drive up and down. And so there is vehicular traffic, but we have a much more rich understanding now of pedestrians and how they move throughout markets. And so in addition to understanding better about the pedestrians moving through the markets, we're also able to understand how they move throughout their markets. So the use of SDK data and the mobile application data not only gives us a better understanding of the numbers and sort of circulation of pedestrians, but also the pathways that they take. Um, yeah, so and in our, in our legacy data, uh, there were just kind of with everything I've talked about so far, there were a lot of default um, ranges and assumptions that we had to use just because of what we had available at the time. Um, and you can see actually that it was modeled on seven different markets. Um, and so now in our current insights data, we have a lot more, uh, just a lot more granular data, a lot more better understanding of people moving throughout you know, business districts on non sort of vehicular drivable roadways, like through shopping areas and things like that. We just have a better understanding of how people can potentially move throughout a market and all the pathways that they could potentially take. Um, and so that gives us a lot more coverage of a market and just better understanding. Um, and another thing as well, you can see the default walking speed used to be 3.4. Now it's 3.1 just based on better data. Um, and so that has also resulted in positive uh, impact to impressions as well, just because people are spending more time in a contact zone or something like that. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So for a lot of, uh, now we're onto the illuminated circulation. Uh, and for a lot of out of home assets, they do have like artificial lighting or non ambient lighting, like things like just lamps, or if it's a digital unit, of course, it's sort of self illuminating. Um, but there are a lot of units that we audit and in our system that rely on ambient light for their illumination. And so they can only really be seen during the, the daylight hours that are giving it light. Um, and so because of that, it's super important to take into account things like time zones, when the sunset and the sunrise are, and also, uh, and this is kind of a big thing for where we are now, the seasonality and the time of year, because all of that has a really big impact into light in a given day and it can change a lot throughout a year. So all of those things, if we actually go to the next slide, all of those things are now taken into account within our circulation. So it's not just 12, 18 or 24 hours, or it's not just kind of assumed activity ranges through a certain hour of days or certain hours of the day, but we have really good understanding of the sunset and sunrise at every location by season. So we can understand, you know, these boards at this time of year get this much sunlight and then you know, three months later, they get this much sunlight and boards in this market because of the way the sun hits, they get this many hours of illumination. So all of that is a lot more granular and specific than we used to be, uh, or than we were able to be in the past with all of this. Um, and so it's just a lot less ass assumptions made now, all understood by the hour, which is a really big positive change. Right. One thing to, you know, you think about time zones, you know, time zones are, they're, they're an hour, you know, as you cross each time zone, obviously, but the, the geographic distance from one edge to the other is, is pretty great at times, right? And so, you know, sunrise in one part of the time zone might come later and as well as sunset than at the kind of Western edge of the time zone. So again, we're, allowed, we're, we're able to account for that more than we ever have been able to do because as Brian was saying, just the, the, the better data we have, the more level of granularity that we have in, in terms of our, our data. Great, thanks Scott and Brian. Um, now we'll cover another one of the major components that has evolved in GeoPass methodology, how we treat the visibility adjustment. Um, we previously touched on the visibility adjustment in our last webinar last month, um, where we discussed key factors that go into the model. However, for today, let's take a deeper dive into what actually goes into this model. The GeoPath visibility model is built upon universal dependent variables 
such as distance and size of the outer film structure, that are derived from previous visibility models. Geopath has continuously worked to refine this model over the years to provide accurate measurement of likelihood to see metrics. In short, the visibility adjustment is aimed at quantifying how the audience interacts with an outer film structure and directly correlates to how impressions are accounted from both those on the road or pedestrians who come into contact with the out-of-home advertisement. Uh, first, let's discuss aspects of the out-of-home unit, like its placement, size, location, that factor into the visibility adjustment. Location of the media within an audience's field of view is important, as the placement of the media and distance to the audience that will be viewing the advertisement play a part in determining the likelihood an impression is generated. Additionally, an out-of-home unit's facing, angle, and size also play an important role in the visibility adjustment, with all variables contributing to create the view shed or viewability area for the structure itself. It creates a model to understand at what points or area an audience is able to engage with this location. Um, speed and dwell time is also incorporated in the visibility adjustment, as the previously mentioned components create an area to understand the points of contact in which an audience may engage with the out-of-home unit, time plays a crucial role in this model as well. Speed and dwell time data sets allow us to understand how long an audience is within this contact zone to view the out-of-home structure. But we'll circle back and touch on this aspect later on in the session. Uh, next slide, please. So with those foundational components covered, let's discuss more on the view shed. The out of home structure's size, location, and angle impact the ultimate size of its view shed. However, as stated previously, additional data sets, such as speed data, provide more insight into how audiences interact with the out of home unit during their time in this contact zone. Maximum and minimum noting distances allow us to understand at what points the out of home unit could be seen to the last point in which an impression could be generated. The optimum noting distance, as seen on this slide, is the sweet spot in which the audience can best view the advertisement. The minimum noting distance is also factored in, uh, as at a certain point, you might be too close to the structure to be able to thoroughly read or engage with the advertisement, especially while traveling on a roadway. Uh, next slide, please. With those aspects of the visibility adjustment covered, let's just recap what has changed. In the current visibility adjustment model, the angle of the out of home structure to the audience is taken to, into account, providing infinite permutations to create the viewable area for the out of home location, as opposed to just general left and right hand reads or parallel or perpendicular facings. Apparent size for the structure to the audience is also taken into account, as opposed to previous models in the past in which distance from the audience and size of the structure are independent variables. Next slide, please. And well, just before we move from this, I, I did also want to add that um, I know this is, uh, we provide a little bit more information on this than, than the last time. There's also, we, we also do in this series, want to have a, a, a webinar dedicated to talking about the visibility adjustment um, and, and what factors go in and, and just the implications of that. So um, that, that will also be um, something we'll be announcing and, and talking about in the future. Great, thanks Scott. Um, so as I mentioned before, let's circle back to speed and dwell time. Uh, the current visibility adjustment takes into account speed data for unique roadway segments, providing the dwell time in which the audience is within this viewable area for the out of home structure. Uh, this is an important aspect, as the greater the time an audience dwells near an out-of-home location, the more likely they are to look at the unit. And the more opportunities those audiences have to see multiple spots on the same unit. In previous models, many road segments had to use an estimated speed instead of leveraging the unique road segment data in our current model. Um, so, for example, in previous models, interstates had an estimated speed of 45 miles an hour, However, we now leverage over 37 million unique roadway segments to understand the speed and trip data along each one of those. Right. And so that's, again, one of the key benefits of, I mean, there's many key benefits of this mobile data. Obviously, you've kind of been hitting on it throughout the session, but just the ability to really have, you know, precise speed data for each of those segments across, you know, across the across the country is, is, is another key factor that really helps us understand 
um, in, in particular, you know, the, 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 the dwell time within, within the contact zone for, for some of these, uh, for, for, for these uh, units that we're measuring in particular. Yeah, so, you know, just to recap, uh, the speed and dwell time within our current methodology, hourly data is utilized for all U.S. roadways, as opposed to in the past using average hourly speed data for most major roadways in our previous models. So that's a major shift. Uh, yeah, so um, moving on for our last part of the webinar, let's just quickly touch on how mobile data has evolved our methodology, more specifically focusing on how we understand in-market impressions. As mentioned before, mobile data enables geopath granularity in understanding how people move about the market or markets. However, mobile data also helps us understand the home locations aggregated by block groups of the audiences passing by all out-of-home media but also provides context of trip motivations from these areas. Geopath is then able to quantify out of market audiences, such as business travelers or tourists, and gain better insights into market impressions for those that reside within those specified markets. Um, moving on to the next slide, let's just quickly summarize what that means. Um, in the past, in market and out of market impressions were modeled off commuting trips from the American Community, community Survey and home locations were aggregated by county. However, using mobile device data in our current methodology from across the country provides insight for all trip purposes and ties back to the home locations aggregated by block groups. With this insight, not only can Geopath tie these trips back to demographic profiles as previously mentioned uh, for audience data, but also accurately reflect in-market versus out-of-market impressions. But we'll look at some examples of this. And next slide, perfect. Um, in this screenshot, we're looking at the Atlanta market showing in-market versus out-of-market impressions in the previous model. As shown, you can see the majority of impressions being counted were shown in the market represented by lighter yellow dots. Uh, most of the impressions shown here are showing in-market uh, impressions. Uh, but if we move to our current model, uh, you can see how mobile data has evolved our understanding of in-market impressions. Geopath can now more accurately determine those from within the market versus those traveling within. A much greater amount of our out-of-market impressions have been counted, showing that there are many more people traveling from outside the market into the market than previously estimated. But let's take another look at a better example. In this slide, we are looking at the Southern Louisiana markets, such as New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, uh, Lake Charles, and Alexandria up north. In the past, estimates showed most impressions were from within their respective market, except for some spillover along the major routes represented by those uh, red dots along those highways between the markets. But if we move on to the next slide, showing our current model, uh, mobile data allows us much more greater level of granularity, especially in understanding through traffic. Along with the major routes between these markets, other primary roads now show a large amount of out-of-market impressions, accurately showing how people move about these markets. Um, so with that, where the mobile data has allowed us to leverage much more insight into understanding how people move about their daily lives. And with that, I'll hand it off to Scott Great. to cover some of the components we uh, discussed. Yeah. Yeah, no, just to, to summarize, um, and again, hopefully this was helpful to start to get an understanding of some of those, uh, as we said early on in the session, some of those uh, factors that really impact out-of-home impressions and specifically looking into our um, roadside methodology. There was a question um, about like place space and how this relates to, and, you know, especially things like understanding circulation, et cetera. A lot of this stuff is still relevant to that, but we also will be um, conducting some place-based sessions in the future as well. We, we did a, um, uh, a place-based methodology webinar um, last summer, but I do want to come back to that and, and refresh that and just do that again, but that's also available in our um, YouTube library and also in our, in our Geek Out library, you can find it there as well. Um, but again, these are some of the key key factors that, you know, again, and I think one of the key things is, is that 
you know, things have evolved because, you know, we had the best information at the time. Now we've been able to evolve to use leverage mobile data, leverage connected car data, SK, SDK data has given us a level of granularity and precision that uh, we, we hadn't had available to us uh, previously. Um, so again, as, as we're winding up, again, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out, ask them. I know there's been some in the chat and some in the Q&A that have come along, but I'll just start sum, summing up. And if you think of questions, again, please, please put them in the chat. Also, if, um, if you think of it afterwards, you can reach out to us at geekout at geopet.org. But as I've mentioned, this is a continuing series we want to do throughout the entire year. Um, so the next session we do want to, to talk about is starting to dig into more of our data sources. So talking about that Claritas data, as well as some of the other data sources that we're leveraging, just so everyone can have an understanding of the type of data, what it's used for, how often it's refreshed, some of the things like that. Again, and, and, what, and just a little backstory on how this series came about is, you know, based on all of the questions we get in Geek Out, we realized that, you know, it'd be great to go back and, and do a refresh of some of this stuff. And so that's, so this is one of the examples of what, why we're doing this, this next session about the data sources, because we often do get questions about Claritas data, et cetera. Um, and we also then, after that, we want to do a series and show you how we audit inventory, even showing you the tools that we use to do that and what happens as a, a new unit comes into the system and how it gets audited and into the insight suite ultimately. And then uh, later in the summer talking about our visibility adjustment index. And then we'll, we'll keep announcing the new sessions as we go along. Um, but again, the, uh, other topics are going to include things like, again, wanting to, to visit the place-based place methodology again and how some of this stuff impacts that. Um, as well as uh, some of the other other important things. So if you have an idea for a session or want something, you know, that you don't see on the list, um, you can reach out to us at geekout at geopath.org. Um, but also just want to go back one slide. This session and any of our other sessions, uh, you can go to our Geek Out uh, tab of our, on our website and just scroll down to out of home office hours. Uh, the six, there'll be six thumbnails there of our six most recent, but you can also click here, right here, it says click here to see our entire library. That'll bring you directly to our YouTube channel. And you could dig through some of the other, um, some of the other webinars that we may have done in the past. Um, a couple ones, again, that I want to point out here. Uh, Dylan and I did a, a webinar recently on the uh, updated region frequency model. So we, we, we did one earlier in the year, but we came back and did a part two of that, which I thought was really interesting. And then um, I know I referenced the, the last two sessions in this series. So this one was the overview of our roadside methodology. And then in the bottom left here, that was the one where we, we kind of talk, started to talk about kind of the, the foundations of, of media measurement. So again, if you want to watch any of those, they're all available there. I think there's a lot of good information. Also, um, like I said, if you have an idea for a webinar, if you have any questions that come up after we're done with this session, um, I'm just checking the q and I don't see any additional questions. Uh, again, feel free to reach out to us directly, always at geekout at geopath.org. And um, just want to say thank you. I really appreciate everybody joining these sessions. Um, and the feedback has been, you know, uh, pretty pretty positive so far on, on on all of these sessions. So thank you for that. Uh, and again, always let us know if there's anything else we can do in terms of education, training materials, anything like that. So just want to say thanks again to everybody and um, have a great rest of your day. So I don't see any other questions, but so thank you for joining and we'll, I'm sure we'll be talking soon again in another webinar.